It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Kazimierz Rzonzewski, though I guess uh, most of you know him already. For those of you who uh, not know him, uh, Professor Rzonzewski is working on both the Einstein condensate since many years. Uh, he was awarded, awarded a lot of um, awards for, for his work, including so-called uh, Polish Nobel Prize, which is a prize uh, given by the Foundation of uh, Polish Science. And uh, today he will talk about fluctuations of Bose-Einstein condensate. So the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Krzysztof. Okay, I'm happy to be able to, to present this talk, even though it would be a lot nicer to, to have it face to face in the lecture room. Anyway, uh, we have to live with pandemic. Uh, so I will be talking about fluctuations of a BEC. And this is a subject on which I've been working with a lot of coworkers over many, many years. Actually, we've started uh, back in 1997, uh, only two years since the first observation of BEC. And since, well, we have written, I don't know, probably uh, close to 20 papers devoted to the subject uh, with many coworkers, people that names you see right now, uh, some are highlighted with a different color and on the top is Mariusz Gaida, and that's because Mariusz was the first companion uh, that was working with me uh, very early in, in, in mid 90s, as I say. And then there are three names at the bottom, which are also highlighted with, the, with red color. And these are guys who uh, co-authored the last paper that we that we have written very recently actually has been submitted only uh, I think end of November last year. Now, uh, over these 24 years, of course, it's not that we had, we had uh, activities all the time at the same level. Everything became much more important and much more interesting. Actually, the subject became hot again. Uh, not because of the progress in the theory, but in the, because of the progress in experiment. And we are happy to have Jan Alt in the audience because he and his team from Aarhus, Denmark, uh, uh, starting maybe four or five years ago, brought for the first time, brought into the scene the very first experiments, the very first measurements of the fluctuations. That really has changed the situation entirely because this question of fluctuation is no longer a purely academic problem. It's, it's a practical, well, it's an experimental one. Something, some ideas can be verified for the first time. Uh, okay, so of course the starting point for such a, such a review talk is uh, flashing this picture of the very first observation of a condensate from Gila, from Boulder, uh, from group of Eric Cornell and Carl Wyman, guys who got a Nobel Prize for this picture, for the experiment that allowed this picture to be taken. Uh, and what we see is a distribution uh, of very, very ultra cold atoms in the trapping potential, which to a very good approximation is a harmonic oscillator potential. Uh, on the left, we have a very uninteresting bunch of, of atoms, and that's a situation, the density, the profile of a cloud is slightly above the critical temperature. And as they lower temperature further, then this peak in the middle grew, and that's the condensate. These are atoms which are practically all uh, loc uh, located in the ball at the bottom of the way of this potential or in other words, in the ground state of this harmonic trap. And as temperature is decreased, then the proportion between the fraction of atoms in the condensate and the fraction of atoms which are around, which are uncondensed or which are thermal atoms, as we call it, is changing. 
and the lowest temperature that they were able to reach is really uh, at this level of, of figure, uh, of, of, of image, uh, almost everything is really at this low temperature in the condensate. So this is really the, the beginning of the very active research field of Bose-Einstein condensation, which is now driven mostly, really truly driven by the experiments. As you probably know, uh, this discovery of a condensate in 1995 uh, happened 70 years after the theoretical prediction of this phenomenon and theoretical prediction that goes back to Bose and Einstein and in some sense more to Einstein than to Bose. Uh, that, as, as I said, has happened in the middle of the 20s. Now, this is of course, a study of such a situation is of course an object of, of statistical physics. And in the statistical physics, the central role is played by so-called statistical ensembles. We are bunching various uh, copies of the system into groups which are described, characterized by some constraining values of variables. And this is called an ense statistical ensemble. There are three major statistical ensembles which are discussed in literature. The most restrictive is called the microcanonical ensemble for which this constraints or, or control parameters are the total energy of the system and the total number of atoms. Plus, typically in classical books, there will be also a volume of the system. But since uh, most experiments uh, on BEC uh, is, are done in these harmonic traps, instead of this V, there should be perhaps omega, the, some frequency of the trap or some characteristics of the harmonic potential which is binding. That's not very important because it's typically in the experiment kept constant. I mean, value is important, but not as the variable. Now, uh, of course, when we talk about thermodynamics, then we have to uh, have uh, some access to something which is called temperature. And in this uh, in this microcanonical ensemble, first, I did not tell you, uh, I should. First, the assumption is that all the states in this manifold characterized by given energy and given number of atoms are equally probable. So the information about thermodynamics is hidden in, in just the uh, degeneracy parameter, just number of states of a given energy and given n. So that is typically denoted by capital gamma. That's how we do it in our papers. And essential thermodynamic equality, which has to be kept in mind, is the way to define the microcanonical temperature. And this microcanonical temperature, its inverse, is just the derivative of a logarithm of this degeneracy, degeneracy factor over the energy. This is very important because practically all the experimentalists prefer to, uh, to, uh, to uh, use temperature as something characterizing the system rather than the total energy. Now, to do any calculation in microcanonical ensemble is awfully complicated. Uh, on the other hand, fully isolated system is best described by microcanonical ensemble. And next in the easing complexity is a canonical ensemble, very often used. That's a situation in which not the energy, but the temperature is a control parameter. So such an ensemble should be used if we have our system of study uh, interacting in contact with the thermal uh, reservoir, which is really fixing the, from outside the temperature of this smaller system. In this case, of course, the energy is fluctuating, but the control parameter, as I say, is T and, and, and number of atoms and also some volume or frequency. The density matrix is, of course, well known. This density matrix as, the, as some kind of the 
normalization factor contains the partition function z, which is a function of temperature and of the number of atoms. Now, the easiest to use is yet less, even less restricted ensemble, which is called the grand canonical ensemble, for which we still uh, have temperature rather than energy characterizing amount of energy in the system, but we do not specify the number of atoms that is fluctuating and the fluctuating uh, number of atoms is mitigated or is controlled by the parameter mu, which is called the chemical potential. And that is really defining the mean number of atoms, but, but the fluctuations of this number are just uh, following, again, the, uh, the expression for the density matrix uh, describing this, uh, this system in the grand canonical ensemble. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the most uh, stringent, the most difficult to compute is the microcanonical ensemble. And just to give you some flavor of what is really to be computed, I will present a very simple example for which all the calculation can be done uh, and even displayed in simple diagram. So imagine that we've got atoms in one dimensional harmonic potential, in one dimensional harmonic potential, there we know that the levels are equally spaced. Of course, the condensate is uh, these blue atoms or the atoms which are just sitting at the bottom of this trap in the ground state. The energy we, are, we know very well, it's h bar omega times n plus a half. This a half uh, we can forget, not that we assume that there are no, uh, no uh, zero point fluctuations, just because we can count energies, not from the bottom of a trap, but from the lowest level. And then we also uh, can describe this energy in the, uh, in the dimensionless uh, way by absorbing, by dividing E by h bar n. Then our energy of this system and of every atom is just given by the integer. And imagine that what we have in our disposal is the energy equal five. Now, this energy equal five can be distributed between uh, excited atoms in several different ways. And all these configurations are just shown in our table. These configurations can be divided into equivalence classes, if you want, each class containing specific number of atoms outside of the condensate, going from the left, one, two, three, four, up to five. We cannot have more than five excited atoms because all the energy that we have in our disposal is exactly equal to five. Now, this, of course, immediately tells us uh, what are the, the respective probabilities of having uh, one, two, three, four, or five excited atoms? Or in other words, what is the probability of having remaining atoms in the condensate? So all the statistics is just given by these by this configurations that are, are, are shown in my table. From that, of course, we can compute everything of interest. We can compute mean number of excited atoms or condensed atoms, or we can compute the fluctuations, the second, second uh, uh, moment of the distribution. This is very easy. Uh, some of all these partial weights, one, two, and two, 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 and one, uh, is the total gamma, is this partition function. And I want you to do to, to make two observations which are kind of obvious when you look at my diagram. First observation is that I, have, I had no need to specify the total number of atoms except for the fact that I, there should be more than five altogether. If it was 100 atoms or 200 atoms, if the energy is five, then this is the whole thermodynamics. So the 
So in some sense, the condensed atoms are just spectators here. Yes, they are spectators. Every whole drama is happening above in the, in the uh, set of excited states. On the left, I just gave you the, uh, the partition function of, in this case, and I stressed that this partition function has some universality to it. If the total number of atoms is greater or equal to five, it is unchanged. Now, uh, this is of course incredibly trivial example, example on which I wanted to, to, to stress that in the microcanonical ensemble, especially, the whole thermodynamics is actually related to some combinatorial questions. And the second is very nice observation, namely that at least in this 1D harmonic trap, whole thermodynamics is somehow easily mapped into the uh, number theory mathematical question. Namely, what we are really doing here, we are looking at various ways of splitting number five into integer constituents, right? So this is number of partitions, as mathematicians call it. And there are both uh, important partitions present here. In every column, we have what is called restricted partition. So partition, which is restricted to situations that we know how many constituents we have. And the total sum is what is called the unrestricted uh, partition. So it's the total number of partition, partitions of a given integer. Now, as you see, this is really a mathematical problem, actually incredibly classical one. For years, I was telling uh, the audience that person who first considered this problem was Euler, but Krzysztof recently found even earlier references to Bernoulli. So it's really ancient question that mathematicians over centuries were busy trying to solve. Uh, in general, it's very difficult, However, two guys, Ramanujan and Hardy, uh, I, I believe in 1918 or something, produced an asymptotic expression for this partition. Uh, it's, it's displayed uh, below. As you see, it's a rather complicated uh, expression. The two guys are, are very special, especially Ramanujan. Uh, of course, many of you know about him, kind of a self-made mathematician, a person for whom Hardy was some kind of a mentor and person who was trying to teach him what really mathematics is all about. And Ramanujan, of course, there are many stories. I have no time to tell you any of them, but, uh, but I would stress that until the end of his life, he believed that in mathematics, intuition is more important than formal proofs, at least his own intuitions. Uh, okay, uh, this, uh, this uh, expression for the, uh, for the asymptotic value of partitions is really very famous, and for years it was the only formula in the Encyclopedia Britannica and, uh, that was attributed to Ramanujan, even though he has done a lot of other things. Now, I said that we've started working. Uh, ah, okay, sorry. Uh, so uh, let's look at the 3D situation. And in 3D situation, uh, a lot can be done uh, in grand canonical ensemble. And in grand canonical ensemble, the, the uh, decrease of the number of atoms in the condensate follows the uh, cubic um, expression, expression that I'm showing below the plot. And, the, and it's also shown in the, in the blue uh, in the figure. However, of course, if the number of atoms is, is, is finite, then there is some deviation and the red curve is the result for 1,000 atoms. There is no question, no problem 
of the equivalence of various, various uh, ensembles if we are just looking at the lowest moment, namely uh, at the number of fraction of excited or, or fraction of condensed atoms as a function of temperature. Uh, out of, of expression for this number of condensed atoms, you can easily uh, compute the critical temperature and you can check that the critical temperature grows with the number of atoms with its cubic root. So this is of no, uh, there's no, no real question uh, concerning this particular quantity. In grand canonical ensemble, uh, calculations are easy. Uh, for many small problems, they are even presented in the standard textbooks. Perhaps if someone is <laughs> slightly older and did not work on BEC, probably he remembers a slightly different expression for the N0, namely with three halves rather than the third power of temperature. Uh, and this is true. This is the corresponding expression for the box, atoms in the box, something that for centuries uh, people were considering it in thermodynamics. In the harmonic trap, spherically symmetric harmonic trap, the expression is slightly different. And it's instead of three halves, it's, it's, it's three. Uh, okay, of course, uh, Riemann zeta function pops up here, as, as probably you remember from, from your courses on, on statistical physics. Now, the situation is entirely different if we look at the fluctuations, at variance of dispersion of, of the population of the ground state, of the, of the condensate. There, Grand canonical ensemble produces completely absurd results, results that go through the roof. Uh, the dispersion at t equals zero is proportional to the number of atoms in the sample. So it, it diverges and, and of course this is not what you expect from the isolated system at all. This disease has been first noticed long time ago by uh, nobody else but Schrodinger. Uh, however, for decades, there was really no need to study these things slightly closer using more restricted ensembles. I will be talking about the way these um, curves for canonical and microcanonical ensembles were obtained. This will come in a few uh, minutes. <laughs> but what I want to stress is that the results are all different. In other words, from the point of view of these fluctuations, there is really no equivalence of various ensembles, at least in three dimensions. Uh, okay. As I said at the beginning, we have started working on this problem with Marius Gaida from the very beginning. As I said, the first condensate was obtained in 95. Already in 97, we had our first PRL published with Marius. And as you see, the, the name of the title of the paper is exactly the same as the title of my talk today. Uh, it doesn't mean that, we, that there was no progress in the meantime. Uh, just on the contrary, this paper is really not very powerful. We were trying to use the saddle point methods and various analytic functions and uh, methods to look at the microcanonical fluctuations. Probably this is the very first paper where microcanonical fluctuations were attacked for the for the atoms trapped in the harmonic potential. Much more important was our next PRL that's done with a group of other co-workers. I will single out Patrick Nave, a Belgian young, at that time young a Belgian physicist from, at that time also from louvain la neve now professor somewhere in Germany. And this we called fourth statistical ensemble. And I will tell a little bit about what, what does it mean in a second, in a couple of seconds. Now, the very first results that were obtained that are of some relevance are again these asymptotic values of the fluctuations. And 
the very first one to attack successfully this problem was David Politz, Politzer, who also in 1997 produced the analytic formula, analytic result for the, for the uh, canonical fluctuations. Uh, and the result holds for n going to infinity, to, for very, 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 very large number of atoms. We, we, we are, even today, we are not sure how many atoms one needs to be really very close to this limit. Some corrections were found a little later. Now, that was a few months before our PRL on the fourth uh, statistical ensemble has been published. And there, we found something corresponding, but in the microcanonical ensemble, there's, there's the other formula. There's a formula for the microcanonical ensemble. As you see, this is the same thing that Politzer had minus something. So in other words, microcanonical ensembles, according to this asymptotic formula, are truly smaller than canonical one. All this is done for three-dimensional spherically harmonic harm, uh, uh, trap. And one can compute, and that's of interest experimentally recently, one can compute the ratio of these two things, uh, namely ratio of microcanonical to canonical uh, fluctuations. As you see, temperature will go away and there will be only expressions, expressions involving zeta function that can be of course checked for the value. And this S, some kind of a rock bottom, largest discrepancy between microcanonical and canonical that we could ever think of is 0.39. Okay, so this is asymptotics. Of course, with asymptotics, not much is known from this asymptotic about small systems or smaller systems. And the most uh, desirable would be, of course, to have explicit expression for the probability distribution of this n excited or n zero uh, particles. That is, to my knowledge, available only for two cases. One, the harmonic oscillator, something which is, of course, uh, related to this partition, and atoms traveling uh, in a ring trap. Uh, the first case, is described by a very simple, relatively simple formula for this P distribution, where Xi is a very convenient dimensionless parameter, which is a function of the dimensional measure of temperature, E to minus H bar omega over KT. Uh, the case on the ring is slightly more complex, uh, I would joke that we should, uh, you should quickly memorize this formula because otherwise you won't understand the remaining things. But, but there was no such a joke. Uh, so as you see, these are two uh, ex explicitly soluble cases. And to the best of my knowledge, these are the only explicitly soluble cases. Both, both were obtained by us here in Warsaw. In particular, the second one has been published relatively recently, last year, in the paper with two young, very young students, Maciek Webeck and Maciek Kruk. But of course, this is not the most interesting physically, well, because most experiments are done in truly 3D settings. So what can we do with, with the 3D? Well, we can do quite a lot. Because the next in complexity is to use some kind of the recurrence relations to compute the relevant partition functions. And for canonical ensemble, this recurrence relation was uh, provided by Martin Wilkins and his master's degree student at the time, Christoph Weiss. Uh, it works pretty nicely and Krzysiek Pawłowski was able to compute things uh, for uh, even not necessarily spherically symmetric three-dimensional traps 
uh, up to something like one million atoms. It's really fantastic and it's enough for most applications because experiments are typically done with at least half a million atoms, but one million is already ex experimentally available, of course. Uh, I want to say something about the complexity of this recurrence relation. It's not very complex, but it's implementation for such large number of atoms requiring, requires incredible numerical precision. Actually, for these calculations, Krzysztof was using calculations with 150 significant digits. Of course, also dynamic range must be enormous because there are small numbers and huge numbers popping up during the calculations. So it's, 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 it's not a trivial thing to really get implemented this, uh, this uh, um, recurrence relation for so many atoms. With microcanonical ensemble, as always, it's even harder. And here we have our own achievement. The best, the best recurrence relation was provided by Zbyszek i Jaszek. Uh, at that time, in 97, he was just the master's degree student studying with me. It's much more complicated because not only it scans the number of atoms to the desired number, but also scans the energies from smaller, smallest to the desired one. So it's, it's getting uh, more and more uh, complicated very rapidly as the number of atoms grows. And nobody so far was able to use this to compute the thermodynamics for more than 1,000 atoms, okay? Uh, 1,000 atoms, and even this only for spherical traps, for elongated traps, asymmetric traps, and those uh, experimental traps are always uh, asymmetric, are not spherically symmetric. Uh, well, you cannot even go to 1,000, maybe 300 for elongated trap is the largest number that we, we were able to handle. Now, but having this access to canonical fluctuations in 3D uh, using the recurrence relations, we are able to compute the uh, variance for various geometries of a trap. And this is showing how nice our figures are. These figures, each of them contains, in some sense, two parts, the rising cubic dependence, and then very rapid fall, very close to the critical temperature. Note, however, that the complexity of everything and the value of max maximal value of fluctuations changes quite dramatically with the aspect ratio or with the asymmetry of a trap, which in our uh, papers are measured by the ratio of transverse frequency to the longitudinal. Fortunately, even asymmetric traps have an axial symmetry, yes. Uh, so there are two frequencies involved. So this uh, ratio of these frequencies in this picture changes from one to 10. And that is just because experiments in Aarhus are playing with this, with, uh, with uh, uh, asymmetries of the trap going to 10. The picture here is for 10,000 atoms. It's, it's not a big, very big deal uh, for these recurrence relations, but it really shows uh, the situation quite, quite neatly. As I said, our colleagues in Aarhus are for the first time measuring these fluctuations. And the very first measurement, the results of very first measurement, plus some comparison to our theoretical calculations, was done, was performed, uh, was done, uh, say, three, four years ago, and paper was published almost exactly two years ago, uh, has been published in PRL and has been chosen as the, as the editor's choice, was, 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 was considered quite special and important by PRL. Uh, and this is the main result of this paper. The scattered points are, of course, the results of the measurement. And the red curve is our best uh, prediction for these things coming from the recurrence relations, in other words, for the canonical distribution. There are some corrections of the critical temperature that we accounted for, 
that amount to that account for the small shift. But other than that, okay, this is really the very first measurement of fluctuations and its comparison to the canonical fluctuations. Uh, Lech, at that time a director of CFT, decided to make some fuss uh, from these results. So Jan has been invited to visit us, gave a very nice talk. And then we had uh, also interview on Polish radio. The journalist, Dorota Truszczak, asked Jan how would he rate complexity of, the, of, the, of this measurement, of this experiment, on the scale from zero to 10, 10 being the most important, uh, difficult and zero being the easiest. And the, uh, Jan answered, well, I think it's nine. So in other words, there is still some room, Jan said, for the even more complex experiment, but it's really, it's really tough. Okay, I will go back in the history of these investigations a little bit, because understanding uh, how to compute everything for the ideal gas very early on was not sufficient. People started discussing the role of interactions. After all, atoms in the trap collide, and, and this should have some influence on the statistical properties of the gas, and there was, and is, to some extent still is, an open question, what is really the uh, deviation from what we know for ideal gas that, that is due to the collisions? Fortunately, under standard circumstances, these collisions are, uh, are rare in some sense in the experimental setups, uh, so the corrections are presumably relatively small, but how small or how big they are, in some sense, nobody knows for sure. So let me tell you a little bit about our attempts to, to attack this, this question. And that goes back to our notion of a classical fields approximation. And this is something that we, we have introduced along with several other groups in early uh, 2000s. And conceptually, it can be explained in a very simple way. If we remember the way electrodynamics was developing, then for decades, electromagnetic field has been uh, regarded as classical waves uh, and electric and magnetic field satisfying standard Maxwell equations. Then came Max Planck, and then he said that in order to understand the properties of the of the black body radiation, one should abandon this idea of smooth classical waves, and one should start treating light as the collection of particles called photons. This, of course, everyone knows. Now, according to our uh, understanding of the development of the theory of atoms, under standard old-fashioned uh, situations, of course, atoms are little spheres that are traveling, flying around in the gas. But when the temperature is really decreased so far that we are reaching this BEC situation, then everything is, uh, all of a sudden uh, behaves like a macroscopic almost uh, De Broglie waves. And Kettle was the first one to show that indeed two condensates expanding interfere very much like the waves uh, on, on the surface of water. So with this idea, we looked at the uh, system of interacting Bose gas in, uh, in, the, in the language of second quantization or, or, or quantum field theory. And then the Hamiltonian, of course, consists of two parts. The first one uh, contains kinetic and potential energy of a trapping potential. And the second one is the interaction. And in most cases, it is sufficient to describe interaction as the contact interaction. And in this case, the, there are four atomic operators entering the interacting part of the Hamiltonian. Now, the idea of classical field approximation is just 
given by this simple relation. Uh, if we uh, expand our operator uh, at the in some uh, one part, single particle basis, that introduces, of course, creation and relation operators of each base function of each mode. And the classical filter approximation is nothing else but forgetting about these operators and replacing them with a C number uh, classical amplitudes. When should it be possible? Well, it should be a reasonable approximation if some given mode is highly occupied. If there is, I don't know, 5,000 atoms in some particular state, then it doesn't matter whether whether it's really 5,000 or maybe a little less or a little more, or, or maybe fraction less or fraction more. However, this cannot be, such a replacement cannot possibly be correct for all the modes. And because of that, there is always, in this classical field of relation, there's always a need for the cutoff. So there's a cutoff, there's a, there's a fitting parameter, if you wish, that is absolutely necessary to make out of this classical field approximation a workable thing. However, once this is done, then instead of a density matrix of a canonical uh, ensemble, we've got just the probability distribution of these alphas, uh, these amplitude alphas, and there is finite number of them. So then all of a sudden we are back in the classical statistical physics. And for that, one can use various methods. Uh, in particular, one can generate a cloud of points in the phase space uh, that is described by this probability distribution using some version of, for instance, Metropolis algorithm. And out of such a thing, one can compute various mean values, various variances, and whatever. We were able to use this very effectively for one dimensional problems. And there is a good physical reason for that. In one dimensional problems, very easily, uh, very, very little above zero temperature, there is a lot of highly occupied modes. That is called quasi condensation. And, and there is no need to, to, to dwell on that in, in my review talk. However, we were never able to make it fully workable tool in 3D. Uh, one reason being that in 3D calculations are incredibly tedious. And if we can go only to two or 300 particles, then altogether is such a small number that this classical approximation is, is, is a doubtful uh, assumption. So we were <laughs> kind of struggling without much success until, until Actually, last summer, this pandemic summer, during which we could work only uh, remotely, and yet we discovered something which is useful, which we call now a quantum metropolis algorithm. So again, we want to, uh, to produce a cloud of points that is representing canonical ensemble, still canonical ensemble. Uh, however, the phase space is defined differently. It is defined by all Fock states in the full Hilbert space. So to the total number of atoms is fixed, but we have different ways of distributing these atoms between the uh, energy levels of the, of, for instance, of the harmonic trap. Of course, we want canonical distribution. So our uh, important uh, formula is, of course, the, uh, the, the Boltzmann factor exponent of minus beta times the energy of a given configuration. And then the whole secret is, of course, in the definition of the dynamics, so to say quasi-dynamics in this phase space that is producing the the, the, the Markov chain of points uh, inhabiting our phase space. So we have two configurations, Ni configuration and Mi configuration. And you have to specify how 
the transition between one, the initial one and the final one is achieved in the algorithm. So we need to produce some kind of the link between the two. And this link actually, you know, the, 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 this, these methods of, of metropolis are very forgiving. forgiving. Uh, there are only some general conditions like the, like the detailed balance condition uh, and, 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 and the fact that, that this uh, prescription should not leave some subspace of our space uh, unavailable. So, so in principle, the system should be able to visit any state in our phase space. So these are basically two main conditions. Otherwise, we don't, we don't know. We are not sure what is the, what is the if, if there is some kind of a preferred dynamics here. And I think we propose something which is truly uh, efficient. And this proposal is based on our understanding of how bosons behave in the real nature. So first of all, the starting point, which boson will jump from our initial condition uh, is just proportional to the number of at each atom has the same probability. So the probability of jumping from is just given by the probability by the number of atoms in given mode. So that is first factor. But where should it uh, end? Well, it should end preferably in the mode which is already highly occupied. This is called boson enhancement. This is a, a simple criterion which works, which explains the action of laser. The next photon produced by the excited atoms preferably goes to the mode which is already highly occupied. That is the slazing mode. Uh, so the same here, the boson enhancement tells us that atoms should rather prefer, so should prefer to go to highly occupied state from the very beginning occupied highly. However, in the, for instance, in the electromagnetic transition, as we know, there are not only the so-called stimulated transitions, those are really uh, telling us that there should be this M factor in the probability distribution, but there are also spontaneous transition to the empty mode. So instead of having proportionality to, to M, we have a proportionality to M plus one. It's easy to check that this is really satisfying this, this condition of, of detailed balance. And it works, it works fine. Now let me go back to the comparison of this method to the previous one based on the classical fields approximation. As I was trying to indicate, the classical fields approximation is assuming that photons are not really uh, coming in, in, in full pieces. They can come also in tiny fractions. And for this reason, such a tiny fraction at not a very high cost of energy can, can be transferred to very highly excited mode. And this is, of course, the origin of the, of the ultraviolet catastrophe that, that pre-Planck theory of black body radiation was encountering, but also is the reason why previous method had, uh, well, needed the cutoff, yes, otherwise uh, the, some results would be divergent. Now, not here, of course, because now we have atoms as a whole jumping from place to place, and they carry its unit always. So going very high up would be very costly. I did not tell you, because I, I forgot to put it on the, on the screen, what is really the condition of accepting this transition or not accepting. Well, it is of course accepted if the energy of M new state is lower than the energy of upper state but it can be also accepted if it is higher, provided it is not much higher and the, and the criterion is governed by the random number R, uh, randomly chosen between zero and one. And of course, if proper uh, inequality is, is, uh, is satisfied, then it can be also accepted. So this is really the idea. Uh, idea is new, it's, 
it's already mentioned only in this uh, paper that we have just put uh, submitted uh, in at the end of November. And let's look at how it works. So these are the uh, tops of the same uh, picture that I was showing before, but now I I want to stress this little uh, stars or something. These are the results for canonical distributions for 10,000 atoms computed now with the help of our new algorithm. And I stress this new algorithm has no fitting parameter, is completely free of, of, of fitting parameters. So it's, it, it gives absolute result without uncertainty, provided of course, uh, some patience is, ex, uh, is, is, is given because uh, one has to really collect a lot of data to have such a nice uh, agreement with the, with the recurrence relations result. Now, from this point, there are two ways that you can utilize the, uh, the, 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 this method. One is to try again to look at the interacting gas, and the other is to try to look at the microcanonical ensemble based on the results for the canonical ensemble. And for that, for the second, which I will start now uh, to tell you now, uh, it is important to uh, remember again that in the canonical ensemble, the temperature is well defined by the energy has some distribution. And these are distributions of energies for some uh, several different temperatures uh, for 10,000 of atoms, something from the, uh, some data from the previous uh, picture actually. So how to get to extract out of this results for the microcanonical ensemble? Well, easy, post-selection, just narrow the range of energies which are admitted and narrow it to practically zero. And then you should have microcanonical uh, fluctuations. That is of course correct. However, as we narrow this thing, then we are losing data. Uh, typically, uh, magic crook is taking results that are containing 400,000 data points. And then as he gets to really very narrow band around maximal energy, and then he's throwing away almost everything and he's left with two or maybe five data points and that's not enough to produce the statistics. However, here is the way out. Well, we do not need to compare just the full uh, canonical situation on the left with a completely restricted one on the top, uh, on the far right, but we can just trace the situation as, as we narrow the, the window of energies. And from this, of course, while still there is a lot of data points, we can extract uh, the value, the limiting value by extrapolation, and that's, and that's done. The various uh, uh, curves here correspond to different, it's all with 10,000 atoms and various curves correspond to the uh, different aspect ratios, different shapes of the harmonic trap, the, the highest being the most elongated and the lowest one being spherical. Okay, so this is really the complete, the most complete set of data, of uh, results for comparison of microcanonical to canonical ensemble. On the x-axis, we still, we, get, we again have this aspect ratio. The, this rock bottom line is at 0.39. That is this result of fourth statistical ensemble uh, versus Pulitzer result. Uh, it's, uh, as I say, it's absolute minimum. And the set of points, the blue ones are for 100 atoms. Then the next one is for 1,000, the red ones are for 10,000, and there is one distinguished thing, which is the greatest achievement of all, which is 100,000 atoms in the harmonic trap. Uh, it's certainly a world, like, world record, and as you see, even uh, for this situation, we are quite far above the limiting value. We, we, are, we don't know, uh, probably one needs not 100,000, but 100 million atoms, to really get truly close to the 0, 39. Uh, we, we, we decided to, 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 to look so closely at this S just because this S 
has been measured recently by our colleagues in Aarhus. However, before I, uh, I, I go to showing the, their results, let me tell you about the other question that, of course, I was uh, telling you uh, we want to discuss, namely the role of interactions. And this is really the confusing situation. Uh, this picture here is, is the, displays the results of interacting versus non-interacting variants coming from different groups over different years, different dimensionalities and different shapes of the trap. Uh, above this red line, there are predictions that interacting gas fluctuates more. Below, predictions that are saying that interacting gas fluctuates less, maximal fluctuations are lower. As you see, it's a state of confusion. Out of these results, it's anybody's guess whether it should be smaller or larger. Now, this is our newest paper. It says microcanonical uh, fluctuations measured for the first time. And this is really the crucial picture from this paper. Let me start with the lower panel. That's experimental results. Of course, these are these crosses with these points. The full black curve is the canonical fluctuation uh, curve for the for the situation of the strap and the number of atoms, which we know is probably about half a million. So Krzysiek was able to compute it. The aspect ratio of a trap is something like 7.5. Uh, okay, and a blue one is the curve of similar shape, namely cubic rise and rapid decrease close to critical temperature that is fitting the measured data in the best fashion. What is striking and what is very clear is that the maximal fluctuations measured are way below the canonical fluctuations, uh, actually by about 28%. And for this reason, we believe that they are an indication of coming close in the experiment to the microcanonical fluctuations. Uh, in the upper panel, we have theoretical results. Again, well, theoretical results are for 1,000 atoms because they are a lot harder to, to do for larger number of atoms. The black curve is again ideal canonical. Blue points are the ideal microcanonical. In this case, also about 28% below. In some sense, accidentally similar to the experiment. But there, but there are also these empty uh, circles or something. And they are both for canonical and for microcanonical, accounting for weak interactions. As you see, both are increased because of interactions. So with our methods, we are subscribing to this upper, so to say, panel <laughs> of, the, of the collection of results uh, that, that Krzysiek compiled uh, to the earlier paper. Okay, we are at the end. There are two main conclusions. One is that for the first time over the last couple of years, fluctuations are no longer academic problem because they are being measured and measured with a precision which is better and better. Hopefully it will further improve. And then on the other hand, we have the uh, very efficient, well, relatively efficient, I would say, very robust way of computing of uh, these kind of fluctuations uh, and the methods used are having no free or adjustable parameters so we are immensely proud of this quantum metropolis algorithm which we have discovered only a couple of months ago there are of course open questions uh, collisions are inevitable collisions are there and we are not sure as I say, we should subscribe now to a club of those who are claiming uh, fluctuations are increasing, but we are not sure whether they are really increasing or not, or decreasing, and it's up to experiment to judge. I hope we are right, but I'm not sure. 
The other thing is that results, these most recent results from Aarhus, are not really exactly matching the microcanonical predictions for the ideal gas. We are not sure why, and the most likely reason is that they do not really extract exactly single energy state, but there could be, uh, rather they have some bunch of energies uh, coming to, the, to, to a single um, uh, measurement point in their plot, but we are not sure, we are discussing this. This is really a subject of the, of the debate between our Danish colle uh, uh, colleagues, Danish, but I hesitated because Jan is German, but in our foot. Um, and, and us actually at PPM, we are going to continue this discussion. And if we have some fantastic results over the next couple of months, probably one of us will present these results again in our colloquium. Thank you for your attention. That's all I wanted to say today. Thank you. You do not have the automatic applaud in a remote meeting, and this is <laughs> strange and funny to, to uh, applaud uh, in these Zoom uh, meetings. So, thank you for the presentation, thank you for being on time. And now we have time for questions. Please, uh, so Adam has a question. Uh, yes, so you mentioned a couple of times, uh, actually, a lot of times, those recursion relations which. Uh, uh, actually, uh, yeah, they help in uh, uh, deriving those uh, uh, fluctuations in the microcanonical and can canonical samples. Can you comment a little bit what kind of a relation it is? Because uh, um, perhaps I missed it, but it sounds uh, well. I did not. I, yes, yes, yes. I, I did not show them, but for instance, this for for the canonical um, uh, ensemble the partition function of given number of atoms and given temperature and given temperature can be uh, computed if we know all partition functions for lower number of atoms and this particular temperature is a sum of combination of disease so so in other words well it's a recurrence relation yes you you start from from one atom or two atoms. Yes, and then uh, we and then you the build to three, four, five, and so on. Okay, thank you. Uh, with the with the Jacek uh, relation, it's more complicated because not only n must be increasing, mm -hmm. but also the energy must be increasing. In other words, you've got some kind of a two parameters to play with, and that and this is the one of the reasons why 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 in microcanonical we are limited to much smaller systems. Thanks. Other questions? I have a question, uh, if I may. Yes, sure. Um, uh, Kazik, you, uh, we were discussing the, the discrepancy, the remaining discrepancy between the experiment and the theory. And, um, and uh, I mentioned a few uh, technical problems we have, but you think that the, uh, the, the fact that we're not me measuring truly microcanonically is the largest effect. Why, why do you think this is more important? <laughs> because it's the only one that I can perhaps compute. Okay. The other are fully technical and I have no idea how to estimate them. Well, the, the technical ones we, we will be working on. That, that's, but but it's, 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 it's hard. There are many, many problems. Yeah. There, the, especially the fitting function, which you mentioned a couple of times, is, is very empirical in the end. Sure. So we, we, we're putting in a few empirical um, evaluation methods, which Ultimately, we cannot, uh, we have difficulty to judge, but maybe in our future joint work, we can really sort of apply the complete experimental evaluation sequence to some theoretical data. Yeah. And then we will be able to sort of make, make, a, make, make a comment on that. Absolutely. We, are, we would be happy to, to proceed this way. Absolutely. Thanks. Maybe I can have a comment because this work is suggesting that the microcanonical ensemble is. Uh, more appropriate to model experiments. On the other hand, for many years, theorists were computing uh, different quantities for Bose-Einstein condensate, also at thermal temperature, at uh, non-zero temperature, at finite temperature, and usually they applied um, either canonical or grand canonical ensemble. 
And does it mean that many results which are current in the literature are not applicable to experiments or shall we recompute everything or it's not so dramatic? No, it's not so dramatic. It, it is dramatic if one thinks about equilibrium uh, situation. In most problems that are of relevance, we are looking at the dynamics, vortices, solitons, uh, I don't know what. Uh, and for those problems, uh, for instance, these classical fields, as we proved, work very well and uh, because the system has no time, so to say, to penetrate very highly excited states. And the same with, uh, so uh, in this case, uh, both classical field approximation is, is absolutely useful, but also some other considerations that are forgetting about this microcanonical nature are of no, uh, are of no big deal, actually. Well, for exact, uh, again, because, well, let's again look at this electromagnetism, yes? Uh, there, the situation, in most cases, the fields are so strong and, and time of the measurement is so short, then thermodynamical considerations, properties of the thermal equilibrium are of, are of no relevance. Actually, as we all know, and it's worth adding here, Jan, in his experiments, needs some kind of a hold town, uh, time to allow the system to equilibrate, to, to come to some thermal equilibrium. Uh, and in most other experiments, there is no such hold time. There are, there are uh, uh, rapidly changing situations. And if such, then the, you know, then the ensemble issue does not arise even. Yes. Yes, probably true. There may be some subtle effects which will depend on. The yeah, sure, 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 sure. But but it's not a major uh, issue. Mm -hmm. It's already twenty to two. I think we should uh, finish now. So let's applaud uh, the speaker again. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. I hope to see you at some point. <laughs>